everybody, welcome to the August 27th school committee meeting. Um, I'd like to motion to call the meeting to order. Is there a motion? Motion to call the meeting to order tonight. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. This is where Annie tells me I don't need a motion to call the meeting to order. Right. Uh, all right. Um, <laughs> as part of the adjustments to the agenda number three, I'd like to ask that we adjust the executive session to actually be at the end. Um, and we could stay in here, uh, but that will allow folks to get their presentations done before we go into exec session. Um, before the notes. And before the notes. And were there any other adjustments to the agenda? No, that was it for me, unless others. Okay. All right, then with that, we will move executive session to be uh, at the conclusion of the meeting, and we'll move into number four, presentations and discussion items. All right, Mr. Beck, Hopkins Academy Student Handbook. Okay. Um, so there's one difference. I wanted to do, I know you guys have the opportunity to, is it okay if I pull up your Yeah, please. <laughs> and shout toward that microphone. <laughs> From this um, summary that was provided for the July meeting, the only addition on here that's different from the July meeting is making a clarification around the definition for the valedictorian. To know the valedictorian is a ceremonial position here in the community, as it is in every community. And uh, at many schools, and including in this community, there's a prize that's given. Um, and I believe it's overseen by the Board of Trustees, but there's a scholarship that's awarded here called the Emerson Class. And uh, a few years ago, um, probably more than a decade ago, uh, the language was changed in that prize. And I think that provides us with the guidance for language for the definition for valedictorian, uh, which is that the student needs to have taken classes at Hopkins Academy for a minimum of three years, which is something that other schools do. Um, one of those things that in two prior schools where I was the principal, that change had preceded me, <clears throat> but what it did is it prevented students from having um, really high grades in through the 10th grade, then subsequently becoming uh, full-time dual enrollment students and not having uh, those courses count into their GPA. So those students never took the challenging courses of the junior and senior year, and therefore were not being measured on the same stick, um, but also so that students coming in from other schools didn't end up in a situation where you had a, a really strong, high-achieving student who only had one year of grades in the senior year could then, um, in class rank, class rank is class rank. There isn't anything that we can do about that, um, nor is there anything that we should do about that. But that's something that's private. It's not public. That goes on individual student transcripts. So a top-ranked student is still a top-ranked student. Um, but I've heard feedback. Um, you know, I know there was a comment in the survey that the school committee put out. Um, and I had two meetings after graduation this year, uh, individually, with sets of parents who just wanted to throw out the idea of making this change, and uh, Angie Kellenman was extremely supportive of making the change because, again, that's how we operated at the prior schools, and uh, I believe it's a common practice that is more reflective of having the valedictorian be somebody who's representative of the school community rather than just the top-ranked student in the school. Um, and so that language is on this summary of changes. The position of valedictorian is the top ranked student in the senior class for the ceremonial purpose of addressing their class and community at graduation. In order for a student to qualify for the ceremonial status, this student must have completed courses at Hopkins Academy for at least three school years. And is, that's inclusive of seven? Is it no, it's a, the only, only nine through 12. Only 9 through 12. Is that, do you think that's clear? That it's only the way that this wording is? Because class um, GPA calculation doesn't begin until grade 9. So GPAs are not calculated for courses taken in the middle school. So for example, even the advanced courses that students take in French 1, uh, Spanish 1, or Algebra 1 yeah. in the 8th grade, they, they don't even, they're not even awarded credit for them because colleges won't even look at anything that students take prior to grade nine. They're only interested in courses that students take from grade nine on. So just to kind of follow this should it say something like the student must have completed um, 
GPA contributing courses at Hopkins for at least three school years? That's inherent in our graduation requirements. They can't avoid that. Uh, okay. So, in other words, they have in, they have to meet our graduation requirements. Yeah. You know, so there's uh, all of the core courses. Um, they'll, they'll have to take at least three years of math, at least three years of science, at least three years of even though our graduation requirements are four. Um, so, if they've transferred in, let's say in the ninth grade, they right. would still qualify to compete for that status. But if they if they transfer in thereafter, then they they. They could still be the top-ranked student in the class, but they could not be awarded the ceremonial status of valedictorian, even if they were the top-ranked student. So, I, I mean, I understand it after you're explaining it. I was just thinking if somebody had a child who was there during seventh and eighth grade and thought that that counted for three years. It, but that's clearly that's described in, in the um, in the program of studies that okay. um, you know those courses are not awarded credit. There's no credit that's associated with them. Uh, and in the GPA calculations, if that's something that we should add to the program of studies, language that indicates, um, you know, class rank is only, it, in fact, there, it is clarified, class rank isn't, isn't, doesn't begin to become calculated until after the, until the middle of the 10th grade year. Okay. So that is actually in the program of studies. So I think what I, I think what you're asking, Heather, is could it be possible, although Is that what you're asking? I'm asking if it could be misinterpreted right. as three school years inclusive of seven and eight. That's not right. what we do. That's, That's not what we interpret it as Exactly. That's all. So I know what the add, intent is. I, would I get add the language between grades nine and twelve. That would clear it up. So yep. clarify that for the purpose yeah. of this definition, mm -hmm. rather than relying on other things, yeah. other areas for people to research and cross reference. That makes sense. Sounds good. Um, and then wanting to address, um, I know that um, one of the members of the committee had um, a question about um, college courses not being counted in, in the GPA. Um, that's something that's already been approved in the program of studies. And so this in, in the handbook was just updating the handbook to make sure that the student handbook the information that's available there is consistent with what we have in the program of studies. Um, but I did want, want to be able to explain that students certainly are not penalized for that. They receive their own transcripts from the colleges. And I went through with Ms. Cullen and several years ago, and uh, we did the exercise again um, last week as she came in to uh, begin to do student schedules prior to the start of the school year. And <clears throat> colleges do, so when a student applies to college, for example, if my, when my son applies to college, for all of the courses that are on his transcript, um, First of all, class rank is de-emphasized. Um, over the last 10 years, the uh, criteria for college admission, the top criteria has become challenging coursework. Um, and you'll see that also reflected when uh, Dr. McKenzie uh, does her presentations or, or any of us do our presentations on um, secondary schools and our, um, our status in terms of accountability. Um, that challenging coursework, the number of students that we have taking challenging coursework that's preparing them for post-secondary school um, is part of what uh, we're gonna be measured on like every other school. We're in a great situation because again, our faculty has removed uh, the arbitrary prerequisites and opened up challenging coursework to any student in the school, which is great. So we're on good footing there. Um, but we've also increased the number of students who are taking college level coursework and Basically what colleges do when they get the application, while we add those to the transcript as transfer credit, um, they're put in as level four courses because they're college courses, which is basically the same as an advanced placement course. And so colleges, when they get that, they do their own GPA calculation. So a student will have a transcript from here that will have the college um, coursework on it. They'll also receive a transcript from the college, so they'll have the college GPA that will also be sent off. So they'll have a Hopkins GPA, a GPA from the institution. The colleges basically take all of that and put it together and they do their own GPA calculations based on how they weight things. In fact, our GPA calculation, the algorithm that we use is set up based on the state college system um, in their admissions program. 
and Ms. Cullinan had done that research when she came in and made the recommendation that we make the change um, to have that be reflective, to have that algorithm be reflective of what, uh, at the very least, Massachusetts State Colleges are doing in terms of their application of weighting um, and examining how challenging the coursework is for students. So students certainly get rewarded. Um, it not being figured into class rank is a common practice. And that holds true also for transfer credit if a student comes in from another high school. Um, part of the reason for that, and I can give a juxtaposition, um, we, we have a, uh, an arrangement with virtual high school. And so our student takes a course at virtual high school. Ultimately still, as the, uh, as the principal, I am the arbiter of any potential grade questions or disputes, even though it's done at another school. Um, and that's part of the arrangement, part of the um, memorandum of, of agreement or memorandum of understanding that uh, virtual high school puts in place is that our principal ultimately gets to oversee. And during the time that I've been here, there have been two disputes that we've created opportunities for students to do things because of extenuating circumstances. That doesn't exist at the college level. I have no say. Um, I have no say for student transfers from South Hadley or uh, Boise, Idaho. I have no say in what comes in. And so that can create uh, huge discrepancies in the coursework that a student takes and create inequities when we're measuring class rank and all of those things. So it's common practice even at the college level, for example, I attended UMass Lowell um, in my first couple of years and even though on my Worcester State transcript all of my grades are there, that's not configured into my college GPA from the school that I graduated from. So that's very common practice also across high schools because we don't have any say nor, nor do we have can we manage the program of studies that come from those colleges to be able to weight them? And you know, there are, there's remedial coursework that students do. Um, and again, <clears throat> removing this um, was something, while I think it's always been in place in many schools, many schools uh, really made a point of ensuring that it wasn't included in, in the GPA calculation within the school uh, around the time of ed reform, primarily because um, the state at that time had opened up dual enrollment and was funding it. So there were a number of students who took on dual enrollment because it was cost efficient for their families. Um, and at that time, there were some students who, you know, they weren't taking very challenging courses at the college level, but those were being weighted more as college courses. And that created inequities because the schools can't manage that through their principal and guidance. So that's basically the reason for, for not uh, counting it in, in the school's GPA calculations, but the students still get rewarded and those weights, the colleges are, are better able to take a look at another college's program of studies and um, have, a, have a clearer understanding of what those weights um, mean on a student's application. So I hope that answers Mr. Shannon's question. And certainly I'm amenable to striking the GPA information from the um, student handbook if that's helpful because it is already in the program of studies and is something that's already been approved by the school committee. So changing those courses that were initially being slated to add the phrase not offered in 2018-2019. Um, and then adding the course uh, media and communications as a 7th and 8th grade elective. Uh, and you can see the course description in, in the summary um, to replace uh, middle school home economics as a middle school elective option. 
and then um, with the addition of a few sections of high school mathematics we were able to add a support class which we don't need to write a description for because that's more targeted um, to students who have a database need for mathematics support. Uh, we were able to do that with a licensed math teacher for both high school and middle school students. But we are able to add a third option for high school seniors on the math track so that they no longer have to take AP calculus but can stay on the honors track and take honors calculus. Um, and that is added into, um, so for students on that normal trajectory where they would take uh, geometry, algebra 2, and then pre-calculus through their first three years, they now have the option of taking AP calculus, um, honors calculus, or probability and statistics, so that they have a, an option at each of those levels, which all of which are considered by the state to be advanced coursework um, in the accountability. So what's the difference, Brian, between honors and AP? Um, it moves at a different pace. It's, a, it's an introductory level, and you know they, they will get to the edge of the definite integral. They'll start out with limits um, and spend a great deal of time in limits, and then um, working with trigonometry and elements of analytical geometry that are applicable to understanding um, the basics of, dip, of uh, differentiation. Um, so the, the course, the meat of the course really would be probably about one third of the course covering limits and into trigonometry and analytic geometry. Probably about one third of the course, if not a little bit more, covering differentiation and then a, basically an introduction to just the definite integral. Whereas AP Calc AB goes right through in an in depth understanding of uh, the definite integral and you know, being, students being able to apply integration for a, a standardized exam. And, and I correct me if I'm wrong, this may have changed since I was in the best school a long time ago, but essentially, because you're preparing to take an examination, some colleges will give you college credit for upon entering college at AP exam. AP courses are technically designed to operate just like a college course. Correct. As opposed to an honors course, it would still be a rigorous course, but it's a high school course. And AP course is really technically at the same level as a college course, and that student demonstrates that they've met that standard by passing an exam. Correct. The degree or better colleges will offer. Yes, uh, it varies from school to school, and one of you know, depending on what score students get, you know, some students, some colleges will only accept five. Some colleges don't accept it at all, but many students do it because they have an understanding of the impact it has on their transcript in terms of competition. Um, but you know, it also provides an option that uh, Ms. Horowitz is piloting this year, where we have some students who um, have taken honors pre-calc and are in uh, are now. Some students have moved to honors calculus, but we also have some younger students who have taken pre-calculus at an earlier age, and this provides them the opportunity to take an honors calculus course and be better prepared to take advanced placement calculus in their senior year. So we have a couple students who are going to have the opportunity now to potentially graduate with five courses in mathematics before the end of high school. And that provides us an opportunity over the course of this year to consider in um, a STEM track, whether it's in mathematics that students can advance themselves in mathematics one year further because we now have a course that students can take in their junior year prior to AP Calculus. Brian, does this course um, for media communications, is this brand new or is this yes. I really like the description. Can we talk about digital literacy and digital citizens? And I think it's, it's encouraging to see that, especially in and, and we wish it could be a course that all, you know, it will give us the opportunity to integrate some things that we believe, you know, certainly the ethics of dealing with communication. We know that we don't do effective, an effective job as schools, as parents, you know, there are still things that we need to integrate in um, so that we make sure that every student gets it. And even here, we're not going to hit every student because it's elective, um, but at least it's going to give us the opportunity to pilot aspects of that curriculum, do an assessment, and look at places where we can make commitments to helping students um, to come out of school with a, a really solid understanding of messaging, um, both sending and receiving, uh, an understanding of basic communication skills, having an understanding of those times when you can write the angry email and then delete it rather than sending it, um, you know, and having, an, uh, you know, using things that are out there in the media to develop an understanding of, you don't have to be broadcasting your life to everybody. You know, and there are probably times that you shouldn't, and here's the reason why. So it provides us fodder for being able to learn from 
the mistakes of many others um, out there, you know, before we make them ourselves. And those are, those are really the only changes that needed to be um, highlighted for the program of study, so there's only those three. You're good. <laughs> Go get some sleep. Yeah. Excellent <laughs> opening day. You thank you for all you did to make it successful. So thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, Annie, community engagement. Yes. So uh, a couple things to bring you up to speed on. You had the school committee had its retreat in July, and uh, several themes emerged from that retreat. Then the administrators and I uh, had a meeting with Bill Deal. He's the executive director of collaborative for educational services he kindly rather than having one of his staff all of his staff are great too but he is going to be working with our leadership team throughout the year so we spent five hours with him I don't remember what day Thursday of last week we talked about some of the things the school committee had discussed in terms of priorities around connecting demonstrating to students and connecting with them demonstrating to students that we care about them that we know them and engaging with families and with our community. Uh, a theme that emerged for the leadership team was asking ourselves what can we do specifically to design and implement structures that support diversity and foster inclusion, so along that same theme. We did talk about with Mr. Deal the fact that, he's Dr. Deal actually, but he just goes by Bill. We talked with Bill about um, not making radical changes in that strategy document just for the next year. Again, those four major objectives are aligned to the educator evaluation framework. These are the things on which you evaluate me and I evaluate the principals and we have a new principal and a new director of student services. So there wouldn't be necessarily major changes. What you would see are changes in activities. Like what does that mean to do those things well? This idea of connecting, caring, and as the leadership team said designing and implementing structures that support diversity and foster inclusion that there should be evidence in each one of those standards in instruction in management and operations which is around building culture family community engagement and professional culture in their school improvement or school strategy documents in the program special education strategy document and in the district strategy document you should see evidence of those themes in each one of those broad categories. And you will see those in October, which will give an opportunity for our principals and the special education director to have spoken with CPAC, meet with their school councils, get input from faculty, and as well as, as look at some data. So that's what we're doing with CES. I wrote a letter to Bill Deal and copied his board chair because he did just wonderful work with us. I'm really appreciative of everything the collaborative does for our district and all of its members. It was really high quality work and we'll continue uh, doing that work throughout the year. And Whole Children, I had a meeting with Whole Children. Whole Children is a nonprofit agency right here in Hadley in the Hadley Farms Mall. And we're talking about ways in which, now Whole Children does not just serve families from Hadley, but they are a resource for people with disabilities and for their families, children with disabilities and their families. So I met with them to talk about how we might work with them to connect our students, uh, have opportunities for our students who might be described as typically developing for them to connect uh, with students with disabilities um, throughout the Pioneer Valley. It's hard for us to get a really good Best Buddies program going because our numbers are so small. Um, and especially at the high school, and I understand this, some students, some students who may have uh, an individual education program or students who may have a qualifying disability for special education aren't interested in that age in being in the Best Buddies program. And so we're brainstorming with them about how we can look at this more of a community effort to ask ourselves um, what can we do to seek out 
anyone in our community who is at a greater risk of being feeling isolated, being marginalized, or being disconnected? What are our obligations to seek them out? And how do we fulfill our obligation to advocate on behalf of those who are at risk of being marginalized and to show, to be kind? Um, so we just started having the conversation. I'll keep you informed of where that's going. And I don't have it on here, but when I mentioned the retreat, it connects with community engagement. So your uh, lemonade and hot dog idea <laughs> that, that everyone got excited about, and I said, oh dear, I've got to plan a lemonade and hot dog party. Well, guess what? Everybody's we really excited about it. <laughs> I, um, I actually mentioned it at a town department chair meeting after your school committee retreat. So sometime, let's say that was, whenever that was, I was at a town department chair meeting. and. They started talking about, well, you know, like public safety does something in the spring to try to connect with the community. The select board and other town departments said it would be nice for our boards to have a, an informal place to say, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is how you get questions answered. And certainly the town has an interest in encouraging people to participate in on boards and run for offices. And the one of the chair people of Hadley Mothers Club, Denise Devine, came in to see me to talk about their events for the year and she mentioned that Hadley Mothers Club and PTO had been floating around this idea of having some sort of community event so she is going to take it back to her board this idea also um, connect with PTO and um, it may be something even bigger than what we had initially talked about giving people a chance to get to know their school committee and ask questions about their schools that it may be a bigger town event because there are other folks and other groups who are interested in, in connecting with people in town and letting people know who they are and what they do. That's a fancy way of me saying I think I just delegated hot dogs and lemonade to people who can do it well. <laughs> and at the same time and an event that I think that could be really wonderful for the community. Great. Yeah. So that's community engagement. Okay, um, capital planning and fall town meeting. So I put us on here and then forgot sure. to ask uh, <laughs> Chris to, to put the capital plan in the packet. I did email it to everybody a few minutes ago. Okay, so okay. Um, but it hasn't changed uh, all that much. We just have to be clear about, um, I think you can also talk about what you sent over to sure. the town in terms of what will be on fall town meeting. And I also know that Heather, um, we'll be looking for someone to represent the school committee to act as a liaison with the capital planning committee. So we need to talk about that. So the real purpose is just to let them know what what we have on the warrant sure. right now. Mm -hmm. and so at the last um, the last time we reviewed this, which was probably in June, we had two items on this year's uh, capital plan: cafeteria equipment replacement and health and security upgrades. Um, the health and security upgrades we've we've discussed. Um, I, you know, again, I hesitate to discuss that yep. in open session. But uh, the cafeteria equipment, it has gone up slightly from where I was before. Um, we when we talked about replacing the cooler, or, or excuse me, the freezer in the Hopkins cafeteria kitchen, um, Diane Zach got a quote for replacement. And when the guy came out, he said, well, both of these are equally as old. And the way they're placed is it's the freezer and then the cooler on the outside. So he said, you're, you're really crazy to replace the freezer with, you know, with where the floor was rusting through. He says, you're going to end up replacing the cooler in a couple of years, but it's on the inside of the freezer. So we're going to have to remove the freezer again to get to the cooler. So he recommended just changing them both of them out at one time which admittedly does make a lot of sense so um, that amount has been revised to reflect this that is also what I submitted to the town um, probably I think at the beginning of August mm -hmm. um, for placement on the warrant at the fall town meeting I wanted to make sure we had it on there um, because you know it, it it's certainly easy to go down on the dollar amount, not as easy to go up. So I figured that right. was probably the logical move to make. 
And those were the only two items that we had mm -hmm. going to fall town meeting and on this year's uh, portion of the capital plan. That seems reasonable regarding the cafeteria equipment in terms of efficiencies and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. doing so it So you're that. less a freezer and the cooler. Correct, yes. Yeah. My only th thing to add is, I don't know if folks on the paper that they're planning, the board is talking about what to do, parking here by the old, um, the old building, the old North Star uh, building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so they're talking about they have a plan to put 30 parking spaces there and connect it to Hopkins, uh, the egress road. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen them yet, but um, I'm seeing if, they, if that gets approved and folks want to do that, why not loop in our mess hall as well, which we have down here is 232. I don't know how old that bit is, but that has to be. That is a very that section, old section. Might as well just do it all. Which it's really you need to. Well, maybe if the school committee were interested and the town had an appetite for that, then we could update those estimates if right. they thought that made sense. Yeah. Do you, I'm sorry, I go ahead. At one point, uh, that with all the building, the groundwork that's going to take place, not wanting to rip up the like a newly paved parking lot, and so that was, I think, the reason for the delay. But there was not. The, the uh, idea of a parking lot was not even in existence then. Right. So if there's another way to get back there, if there's a community that is addressed. Mm -hmm. Did you want to ask about, that might be a nice Yeah, so is that discussion part of capital planning or part of a different um, meeting that they're having in terms of the parking lot over there? I don't know. Yeah, is I know. That, uh, David Tudrin. Put together the plan. I was talking about, so I was going to contact him and see where it's Okay. Yeah, because um, uh, Christian Stanley had reached out to me about having a capital planning liaison from the school committee attend their meetings, and unfortunately, their meeting is tonight is at the same time, the really? capital plan meeting, yes. Uh, and so I did tell him I would get back to him about having a liaison. I think, I think it's a good idea. Um, I don't know that we need to formally appoint somebody like we do with other subcommittees, but maybe have it more floating as to who is interested in attending. And I would think with the field work, yeah. you know. I'm like, interested in doing it, it'd be nice to have a backup. Some yeah. Time. Is there anybody else that's interested in being a backup with that? Mm -hmm. I'll double check. Right. It's, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can always be a backup as needed, but maybe we have you as the prime and then we can figure out, because um, I also don't know whether Keith is interested in that too. Yeah. Okay, I'll get back to uh, Christian and copy you on that. Okay, so they're probably talking about what we submitted for the talk with the, the fall. So every single department submitted. This 10-year plan is now townwide, and Christian was wonderful when he called me also and said, he just wants to make sure that the school department doesn't get lost in the conversation because there's so much happening right now in terms of building projects. So it'd be nice to have a school committee liaison. Um, and so it's not, you, no school committee member, just like with Triboard, um, it's you know certainly no more than two people are there at a time that you don't vote right. on matters there. You converse with them, and, but you're not, a, you're not voting on anything and then we also don't have to worry about issues in terms of their meetings are public posted meetings but you don't then represent a quorum of this body um, but you certainly contribute just like in tribal to answering questions but that's I think it's to keep all departments represented in that conversation okay so to go just to go back to the capital budget and timeline, any concerns or questions with what we've got mapped out here? I mean, I, understanding the caveats about rough estimates from, you know, and some of these are very dated. Yeah, and, and something like the parking lot, of course, if you remember a couple of years ago where we fixed the drain area that was yeah. sinking into the ground. So it's one of those Pandora's box, more or less, you just don't know what you're going to find so you know we could certainly get an updated estimate they but they'd probably give a, a quote and then say it's contingent upon what we find when we strip the old parking lot out you know um, so it would be one of those things where we'd want 
some kind of a contingency in effect just to you know take care of it if there was something that really needed work. I think it'll be very helpful to participate in this conversation, have school committee representation at the table. Yep. I'm also thinking of something else related to this. So we do our best estimate, and those estimates are very rough because, as we've explained before, we're not going out and getting up-to-date bids and then not giving people jobs because they'll just stop bidding on jobs or drive their prices up uh, when they do bid on jobs. But it's also so we can see, I mean, we're, this is just one piece of the pie. And as I said, then there's all these other departments and the town is trying to then set priorities for all of these departments and connect projects. Where do they make sense? Something else that came up, I believe it was Christian who asked me about this, is in the moves with the senior center and the library, Hadley Media is looking for a home. So they asked what kind of space we have here. Now, we really, I explained to Christian that one, I have to let the dust settle in terms of classrooms, enrollments, and where everybody finally lands. So off the top of my head, I couldn't think of, we're very pressed for space already here at Hopkins, but I certainly said we would look at it. But then he brought up that there was even a discussion about where their longer term home would be. And um, I said, well, if um, the school committee has just started talking about and exploring would there be a time in which a mass school building authority project might make sense? Um, so it would be good to be a part of that conversation early on, right? As, yep. as the town's having these longer term plans around buildings. So that's something else that may come up. And good. that's, um, you know, at a higher level, that makes a lot of sense. On a, on a smaller level, you know, the, Browns project is something that comes, has come yeah. up many times. It's mm -hmm. very visible, it's pretty well known. Um, the other big item on here is year three with the lockers. And I know it's come up a number of times for us. The last sort of very large, substantial, out, out of the norm expenses that we did was the computer upgrade that mm -hmm. I can think of, right? It's not a school bus, which you anticipate mm -hmm. starting out in five years. How much, um, is there any awareness building that we need to do as we did back for the computer upgrade project so that um, that goes as, as smooth as possible? Or do we feel as though there's a good level of awareness and understanding that that girl's locker room is in terrible shape, has not been upgraded in a very long time? Because people aren't walking through the girl's upgrade, the girl's locker room, it's very, it's not evident. Mm -hmm. um, Becoming a strategy is prudent. I, like, I think it, I don't know how much awareness there is in, if it's selected, right? Okay. Because you know, I haven't heard about it other than through here. Because it's not like my son is talking. That's about right, it, right, right. So that's. But I I agree that being strategic about how we talk about that well in advance of next year is good because it is a it is a big ticket item. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even just talking about like what some of the modernizations of it would be, or what kind of you know uh, enhancements it offers that we don't have now, and right. and bringing it online with you know kind of modern <laughs> day right. and facilities. And maybe, maybe it's um, the the um, the vision told through the eyes of the young female athletes and mm -hmm. their coaches. Maybe it's you know taking in consideration real um, sort of current day standards for locker rooms and other um, mm -hmm. campuses that they're going to, that they're right. traveling to, and they're able to write about it and talk about it, and we're able to set the stage for um, you know a, a bulletproof argument mm -hmm. to get that funding. Sure. My, my daughter's not an athlete. I doubt she'll be stepping foot in the girls' locker room except for PE, and, but I, I think yeah. it's an equity thing, and yeah. if we want to be competitive and attract the best students, all students, female students included, we need to have a good locker room. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on capital planning or the fall town meeting? No. We'll keep checking in on it. Yep. Okay. And that we don't need to do anything for no. approvals? No. All right. Okay, personnel report. 
So it uh, looks rather busy. It's in your packet. Yeah. And um, so in some cases, just so you know, you had resignations previously from ESPs, which is why you see so many new hires for educational support professionals. So you had uh, seen resignations earlier. And, and in some cases, we have folks who um, had informed us that they were going to be working for another agency and then were thrilled. Then they emailed us and said, that's not what I thought it was going to be. Can I come back? And the job was still posted. So it, it still registers as a hire because they had resigned and then they came back. But um, some of these are, are returning faces. Um, and yeah, so that's why it looks busy. Congratulations on filling all of those positions. Yes, and we <laughs> may <laughs> have. <laughs> Yes. So, and we may still have uh, an, an educational support professional. We may still have another. In some cases, obviously, this some of these are driven by individual students' education programs and plans mm -hmm. that require one-to-one uh, -one support or require a certain kind of support that meant we had to hire folks. Um, and in some cases, those students we have students here. Who are who are uh, the responsibility financial responsibility of Hadley Public Schools because or the town of Hadley because they live in Hadley. In some cases, they're students who are school choice students, and as I say, the wonderful part about that is that the financial responsibility rests with the sending town, and we get the benefit of having a hire that does more than I mean we get benefits from that. So that's great too. So given that math is not on the current vacancy, and we had. A resignation but you've got some new hires and we yes. heard from Mr. Beck about the mm -hmm. influx of math interest. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we're okay. We are average. okay. We are in good shape. We are in awesome. good shape. Yes. Every We're fully staffed with uh, certified teaching positions and we're not 100% sure that we need another ESP. We, uh, Ms. Haywood stopped me in the hall today and said I might. I said at this point I, I probably wouldn't notice at this point. I mean, just <laughs> we've had so much activity here, but uh, she'll keep me posted. Okay. Moving on to public comment. Any public comments? Guess not. Nobody here. Okay. Uh, business manager report. Okay, so we have um, a few things to go over. Uh, the expense report, you have the printed copy in front of you. I apologize it wasn't in your package. We actually had a VADAR issue where, for whatever reason, this report would not update with anything past June 30th. So <laughs> it wasn't until this afternoon, about 2.30, I was actually able to work with them and get it straightened out. So here you have it. I, I mean, I, I couldn't quite understand what was wrong when we already spent the full amount of people's salary after uh, <laughs> no days of school. So. Um, you would have you would have not liked that report. So this one's much better. That's it. We're done. <laughs> and and really not a lot. You know, it's early in the school year, so I mean there are some accounts that are over. There's one account that's over in contracted services, but we have to transfer some of those expenses out uh, to another account. So that's you know that, that's easily remedied. And um, other than that, so far we're looking pretty good. So just a question about like. Uh, page seven electricity and fuel oil and gas and propane and natural gas it always seems like every year we never know with like locking in rates and fluctuations anything on the horizon on that that you can think of uh, well we did lock in like for example you see the oil yeah uh, there's two thousand or twenty two hundred dollars remaining yeah uh, so we lock in for the elementary school and the high school and for Hopkins so those prices are pretty much what we've bought you know we we own that oil to be delivered throughout the year yeah. um, with the exception of the twenty two hundred dollars that amount is for the central office building that we can't lock in because you know they have these huge tanker trucks that just can't fit down the driveway to put 300 gallons of oil in our tank they usually deliver seven thousand at a time to each of the two buildings so um, you know that that amount unless we have an unusually cold winter, mm -hmm. uh, which actually last year we did, and we ended up having to buy some additional oil because the heat was just running nonstop. Um, but that should be you know, pretty much all set. Um, 
propane and natural gas, some of that is to be split with the uh, cafeteria. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it all went in here and in the encumbrance column, but oh, okay. we will transfer some out into the cafeteria. Um, you know, telephone, that's, that's never really an issue. Um, and the electricity, again, that's kind of a wild card. Um, Mary encumbered what we had used last year. Mm -hmm. You know, um, again, and I think this year we do have the loan for the improvements coming off, so that would be, uh, I believe it might be in February, so we'll have a few months of $1,000 less than what we had last year. Um, that pretty much puts us right in the ballpark again. So, um, yeah, those, those are typically a wild card. To be honest, the real wild card in this is water and sewer, which... I, I spoke with Jeff Mish about this because just looking at the bills um, for water and sewer, the elementary school uses about, I forgot now if it was three or four times as much as, the, as Hopkins. And, you know, I mean, student numbers, they have more students there, but not, not that much that you'd think it'd be three to four times as much. So I spoke with Jeff about it, and he said that, well, you know, the, the kids wash their hands a lot, you know, <laughs> which it's not a bad thing. Um, but it's it's something we're watching because, you know, as a result of that, of course, then the sewage costs also go up because they're they're tied to your water bill. Um, I did speak with him about the potential of a leak outside of the building. You know, sometimes you'd have a leak in the water line coming in. But he said the, the water meter is in the building, so if there was a leak, it's before the water meter, so that wouldn't be reflected in our bill anyway. And of course, if there was a leak in the building, we'd know about it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just one of those items that we're looking at because, um, you know, watering of fields, which we don't do, um, but for example, with the athletic fields, when we do have an irrigation system, we're going to need a separate meter for that. Right. Otherwise, we'll be paying sewage on water that's going out in the fields and not through any pipes or anything. Mm -hmm. So. Um, if, if we do the well, then, yeah, then we're all set with that as well. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's that kind of thing that, you know, I, I asked him, are we watering fields? And he said no. So, you know, we're watching it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, grant report. There's nothing um, at this point in time. The, a couple of the grants are actually running until August 31st, so we can't apply for a new one until the you know current year is done. We've already spent all of the grant money and all of the grants for FY18, so uh, there's nothing left to spend in any of those. Yeah. And even the FY19 grants, there's only a couple of them that have been approved. Uh, the rest are in application process or waiting for the grant year to end. Uh, revolving accounts report, you have, it, I think it's the last page in your meeting package. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. um, Again, you can see um, lunch accounts, for example. Again, that's in the negative. We have the same issue. <laughs> You're liking that, aren't you? I am. Um, we have the same issue again where you know, we'll get the June reimbursement in July. Um, and we had some come in, but they just said that there was going to be an update on that. So apparently they, they being the government, uh, gave the wrong amount so they're going to give us some additional funds as far as that goes. Um, however, as I said here, I expect a tight year with the lunch program. Um, I think it's, it's really just going to be one of those things that, you know, it's, it's always tight at this point in time. You know, last year, if you look, we started at $5,500 in June, and we had the same kind of experience where, you know, you see in July, and well, not really in August, but in July, the amount went up considerably because we had those reimbursements come in. Um, we're starting this year $6,000 in the hole with um, reimbursements coming in. So, you know, if we ended the year in the hole when we started with $6,000, we're not going to do much better if we're starting with negative $6,000. Um, and I did transfer a portion of our food services director's salary to the local budget to take some of that off of the lunch accounts. Obviously, I'll, I'll have to do that again uh, in FY19. The school choice reflects 
it gets lower this time of year anyway. Yeah, the school choice uh, reflects the final closeout of um, of FY18, which we are still waiting on. Uh, we had an issue with one of the electric bills where it was was paid by the town, our bill, um, and they charged our accounts to it, but we never got the bill. It went right to the town hall. Um, it, was, it was the Hadley Solar Bill, which does go straight to the town hall. Then they mark off which bills, you know, which portion of the bill is ours, and they send it over. This particular time, um, the town accountant was on vacation, so someone else paid the bill, charged our account, and then I went over and I said, hey, I'm waiting for that Hadley Solar Bill. It hasn't come yet. And so they, they gave us the bill um, and said, okay, you know, pay your portion. So we paid our portion, and then they said, oh, we paid it already. So, so they were sending the whole bill back. Then it got credited to FY19 because this was already in July. So there's a little bit of a, of a, a truing up on the town side. It's, it's apparently quite tricky to undo an FY19 expense and move it to 18. So uh, Justin is taking care of that, and once that is done, we'll be able to do that final um, entry to bring the um, amount back up to zero. I used $250,000 here. The rough estimates that I had now were two forty nine dollars and change, so um, it's, it's going to be pretty close to what, what mm -hmm. was estimated. Okay. On school choice? Yes. Just yeah, you can see at the bottom here it came down by, um, well, it didn't come down by two fifty because, of course, we also got in the revenue uh, for the month of June, but the two fifty was being charged. The school where shows. are the estimates coming from? I'm not trying to shout at you, so everybody can hear. But um, the, where are the estimates coming from? The estimates for the transfer of the June. Oh, you, so I'm getting confused here. This is uh, final June, That's final correct. FY18, not yes. any estimates into FY19. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. This is as of June 30th. Sorry, I think I thought you were talking about estimates into 19. I thought maybe I hadn't. Something had come out of the department that I had to Oh, seen. no, no, unfortunately not. Okay. So um, just one more question on school choice. Yep. Last year went from about this level up to a million for uh, the new year. Do we expect an increase again this year? Um, I, I, say, I, I could probably better, we can much better answer that question in um, after we submit our October 1 data. But um, what I can do, are, so I think it, uh, I showed you where uh, for our FY19 estimates, I took out, I just eliminated seniors. And I, and as you can tell, we have 67 students who enrolled, many of whom were school choice. So by just eliminating seniors, and we also had some students that choice to other districts. So that, that's a, the best estimate, but it's not a very good one. And then on October 1, every single school district has to submit their actual data of who is sitting in your, who is attending your schools and where do they live. And so when we do that, DREX in my office does that, communicates with all the surrounding districts, then I have a much better picture of what, um, it, at the end of October, we can bring you a better estimate after that. And then certainly by November, when the state has certified all that data and they send us an updated Excel workbook, then we can do it really to the penny, assuming no kids move in or move out. Okay, okay we already covered capital plan. Yeah. Yes. All right. Great. Then we'll move to topic eight school committee reports and discussion. Uh, policy. I know Keith and I are policy subcommittee. Yes. We'll have a meeting a at some point in the future. Riveting, paper heavy meeting for we, you. We are looking forward Thank to it. Thank me now. <laughs> um, finance and tri board. I don't think we've had a meeting mm -hmm. since we last met. I so, so I have no yeah. update on that. Fields. Paul. Well, we're still working on fundraising. We had a couple of um, meetings recently with some funders, and we're waiting for back. The, yeah, yeah. Chris, Chris, you've been working. Yeah, we're trying to get the, just the logistics moving. I did get a response um, today. I called and emailed again. This is Berkshire Design? Yes, and uh, I got a response to that saying that he would have a summary of the changes needed um, in the next couple of days for us. Uh, and I'll, I'll forward that on as soon as I receive it. Um, 
but yeah, apparently they had, you know, several changes to the plans that needed to be made. And uh, had they met with the conservation group? Okay. No, um, they were supposed to meet at the August meeting, and they were placing the ad in the newspaper. And apparently, they placed it a day too late to be, you know, enough of a lead time for the meeting. So. I got the phone call saying, I'm sorry, but we can't do it in August. Can you let me know when, when that's going to It's going to be in September, I assume, so I, I'd like to attend that. Yeah, I have, um, and I forwarded this to you. I got it this afternoon. Did you? Okay. Um, they, they submitted the legal ad for the newspaper on August 16th. They will have the plans uh, with revisions to the Conservation Commission by next Tuesday, a good week before the hearing. So. Okay. I'm not sure of the actual meeting date. I'll have to find that out. Yeah, we can ask For some reason, I'm thinking to. September 12th, but I, I'm not really sure, so I'll find that out. So these are comments that uh, Berkshire Design received from Mass DEP. It's a request to change it, so that's what they're working on. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're meeting with the Headley Conservation Commission. <clears throat> Let us know if you need any other support for yeah, that Hadley Conservation meeting and then we should probably plan after that to go brief the CPA yeah yeah so that was September 12th the Hadley meeting Conservation Commission I don't think we have the date but we will ask or we can look right it up there. on the actually we can look it up on the town website they may have posted it if it's a Hadley meeting right. okay yeah I'll look it up right now. yeah if you go to the town website it's probably posted already and I did talk yesterday to those funders that were I know there was another name you gave me I haven't heard Person, but the other funding group is start to their meeting soon. Discuss. Oh, good. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Okay, anything else on the field? Okay, Camara, CES. So um, there uh, was not a meeting of the CES in August, but they, uh, due to the length of time between meetings, they shared an executive director's mm -hmm. report, which I shared with you all today. Take a look. They're doing some great work. Um, a particular note was um, they're organizing a team to look at and uh, identify needs of their districts that they could serve. And I believe they facilitated a conversation. I'm not sure any of you were part of that. I was there, yeah. Terrific. Uh, it sounds like it was a vibrant discussion yeah. and lots of important ideas were shared about the things that districts were struggling with. Mm -hmm. And um, CES is um, brainstorming the new ways that it can help solve those needs. So. Um, take a look at the report, and I'll attend their September meeting in November. Great, thank you. And okay. that conservation committee is September 11th. Is it? Yeah. Do you know what time? Do you know what time they meet? Do you still have that window open? I do. <laughs> Let's see. Oops. 7 p.m. Okay. Second Tuesdays of the month at 7 p.m. in the select board meeting room of the town hall. Thank you. Great, okay, we have a couple action items before we go into executive session. Um, first is approval of AP warrants submitted in July 2018. Is there a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. All abstain? Okay, approval of July 30th, 2018 minutes. Um, any questions or comments, revisions to the minutes? No, that was a nice, good. nice job. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great, great session. Good capture of it. All right, is there a motion? Motion to approve the July 30th minutes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And approval of the warrants submitted in July 2018. favor? Aye. Aye. We already did the other approvals. Um, our next regular meeting date is scheduled for September 24th, 2018 at 5.30. Any conflicts with that? As we all look at our calendars. good to me. All right, we will plan on that. Um, 
I do need somebody, if they could read the statement underneath number two, executive session, we will um, reconvene afterwards. Move to go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and contract negotiations with non-union personnel. I have determined that open meeting will have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and to reconvene in open session. Okay, we need a roll call vote. Keith is absent. Oh, you need a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Second. Okay. Keith absent. Uh, Tara? Yes. Paul? Yes. Mara? Yes. And myself? Yes. Okay, we will go into executive session.